Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Vertical Space, a podcast at the intersection of technology and flight. We are your hosts, Jim Barry and Luka Tomjanovic, and here we look at the most important forces shaping the market of advanced air mobility, with a particular focus on why and how they matter to those building a business in this very exciting and growing industry. Radical innovation does not come from the auto industry, and radical innovation doesn't even come from the battery industry. The lithium-ion battery came to us from outside the battery industry. Hey, everyone. Welcome again to The Vertical Space. This week's guest, Professor Donald R. Sadaway, is someone I first discovered when I was one of millions who watched and was inspired by his TED Talk. I've recommended that TED Talk to a lot of people throughout the last couple of years, so you can imagine how excited we were when he accepted our invitation to join us in a conversation. You may enjoy this podcast for a few reasons. Professor Sadaway is one of the world's top experts on energy and batteries, one of the most important topics in our society in aviation and advanced air mobility. If we don't get what we need from batteries, those who have invested billions simply won't realize their expected returns, and we won't achieve the value we're expected to realize to our travel and transportation system. He talks about what is needed for radical innovation versus incremental slow improvement, and where he believes radical innovation is going to come from, and perhaps even more surprising, where it's not going to come from. As the founder of six companies, and with Bill Gates as one of his investors, listen to the advice he gives to entrepreneurs for starting a company. He's an extraordinary educator and teacher, and having had one of the most popular courses at MIT, listen to what he learned from his students and what he believes his students learned from his classes and how teaching became essential to his inventing. Listen to the careful steps he took to make his courses so popular. And as you listen to the podcast, you'll hear what makes Professor Sadaway one of the most influential people in the world and why he believes that electrochemistry can be a contributor to world peace. Heck, just listen to what got him on Stephen Colbert and why he was such a good and entertaining guest. Finally, and I don't know about you, but I get a bit tired of people who talk about how they're going to change the world. How about doing something important first, then tell us about it. Well, with Professor Sadaway, he has and continues to play a meaningful role in bringing about real and important change in this world. This is a guy who has done it and continues to make a real and meaningful difference. We were honored he joined us on the podcast. Thank you, Professor Sadaway. Now, enjoy our conversation. This episode of the Vertical Space Podcast is brought to you by UAvionics. UAvionics is the leader in low size, weight, and power certified avionics for manned, unmanned, and advanced air mobility aircraft. Let U of Ionics help you achieve your goals, whether that be type certification, airspace access, or beyond visual line of sight operations. U of Ionics has certified and certifiable communications, navigation, and surveillance avionics for your aircraft. So head over to uavionics.com or Google it to see how you can start flying safer and move your platform forward into shared airspace. Donald R. Sadaway is the John F. Elliott Professor of Materials Chemistry in the Department of Materials Science and Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He obtained the PhD in Chemical Metallurgy from the University of Toronto in 1977 and joined the MIT faculty in 1978. The author of over 180 scientific papers and holder of 35 U.S. patents, his research is directed towards the development of rechargeable batteries for grid-level storage and for EV propulsion towards environmentally sound technologies for the extraction of metals. He is the founder of six companies, Ambry and Boston Electrometallurgical and Pure Lithium, Avanti Battery, Sadaway Labs, and Lunar Resources. Viewed over 2.4 million times, his TED Talk is a narrative about inventing inventors as much as it is about inventing technology. In 2012, he was named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Professor Sadaway, Jim Barry, Luka Tamjanovic, welcome to the Vertical Space Podcast. It's a real honor to have you on. Pleasure. So, sir, our first question we ask our guests is, is there anything in the industry that very few people agree with you on? But I'm going to ask you a two-part question. First, is there anything not everyone agrees with you on? But also, if you could tell our audience, uh, you are a globally recognized person. Could you explain to our audience what you've done and what your history is and what you've done in batteries that makes you so well known? Well, I I can't answer with uh, surety what to what I can attribute the popularity. It could be one of many things, but uh, you know, I've I've worked in the area of uh, applied electrochemistry and metal production and in batteries. I I think the uh, the burst onto the 
scene occurred in 2012, 10 years ago, when I was invited to give a TED Talk. And this was not one of these TEDx or Baby TED. This was the TED Talk at uh, Long Beach, California. And uh, that TED Talk was about the liquid metal battery, the inventive process, and so on. That's That's been viewed almost two and a half million times. And then from that, there was... Uh, being named uh, by Time Magazine in 2012 as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And then after that, I, I ended up on the Colbert Report, which at the time was a pretty uh, widely viewed, uh, for lack of a better term. It, it was part informative, part comedy. And um, it's very rare for someone in uh, academia, with engineering, and, and so on. I mean, if I were talking about you know, human relationships or, or medicine or something like that, you could understand, but to be talking about something as boring as batteries, to end up on Colbert was uh, that was quite a quite a. It feat. was a great it was a great interview, sir. You handled him beautifully. <laughs> I think I I was being handled, but anyways, it was uh, I managed I managed to get through the the grueling uh, procedure. He, he could be very <laughs> charming and he could be very nasty, and I was lucky he was charming with me that night. So you know, the, the, those are kinds of things, and then. The other thing that I do is something that I've actually talked about, but it hasn't really caught on with my colleagues, is that from time to time, I will write a letter to the editor in whether it's a New York Times, a Wall Street Journal, or Financial Times on a matter pertaining to uh, technology to be uh, expository, to help people understand what the issues are. And uh, I think that that's a, that's a place where perhaps uh, academics could, could play a a better role. And I, I'm, I mean it to be a, po a positive role, not to just be uh, decrying things and calling people idiots and whatnot. That's that's not the purpose. The purpose is to inform and help everybody uh, converge on a, on a good solution. So maybe that's why some people have heard of me. You've also said, and I believe it was mentioned on the Colbert uh, show, that you can help to bring about and create world peace. I mean, you have a bit of a cult following. Why is that the case? Well, you're right. I, I talked about that electrochemistry is the key to world peace. And this is, remember, this is 2012. It was before the Russian invasion of Crimea. And uh, I was already t talking about by the invention of uh, green technology that would make petroleum no longer a strategic commodity, we would topple dictators halfway around the world without firing one round of uh, munitions. And uh, that, that was the, the gist of my uh, comment. What area within the area of energy and battery technology, what's an area that very few people agree with you on? Well, I, I don't really pay attention to what other people are saying, so I'm not sure about this. I just press on. I look at the landscape and, and identify what I think are unmet needs and, and, and strike out on my own. I don't follow the pack. So, you know, I, I'm the only proponent of liquid metal battery. I don't touch hydrogen. I don't touch fuel cells. As uh, Dirty Harry says, a uh, man's got to know his limitations. And so I, mm -hmm. I, I, I basically say no to certain endeavors. I focus on things that I, that I really want to excel at. And then, of course, on the area of, uh, of steel, zero greenhouse gas emissions on that one. That's in molten oxide electrolysis. I do not have any uh, patience with uh, hydrogen. So how about those is a few things that <laughs> okay. we might, uh, some people might disagree with me on. And, and I think uh, it's, it's important to take, a, to take a position. I remember that we had this uh, senator, Paul Songus, here from Massachusetts. Sure. He, he would quarrel with people like Jesse Helms and, and so on. And he said, I'm proud of my enemies. He said, if, if you've been in politics for 25 years and everybody loves you, you probably don't stand for anything. Yeah, let's let's just say that there, there may not necessarily be agreement on on the path forward, but but as long as we're all sincere and earnest, we can learn from each other. So, Professor, on that note, can you uh, paint a picture of energy in the context of aviation and what you see as unmet needs in aviation, and particularly advanced air mobility, if we include drones and EV tolls and the likes? I have to confess right at the outset that I uh, I, I love to fly as a passenger, but I, I, I've i not done any aerospace engineering, so I'm, I'm just purely a gadfly on this uh, question. But I, I know that people are concerned about uh, CO2 emissions and, and whatnot, other emissions that come out of the jet engine, ways to decarbonize, or, or let's, let's not just leave it at, at carbon, because those temperatures are probably putting out some NOx and some other things. But let's just say to try to 
to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from uh, air travel. So, I mean, there's certainly room for some way to mitigate. I know people have talked about biofuels, and, and again, that's an area I don't touch. When it comes to drones and so on, I don't think people want to put fuel, liquid fuel on a drone, although the people have talked about doing so. So that means it's you really have to have advanced batteries that have thrust greater than weight. Otherwise, you're, you're not going anywhere. So that means you've got to start inventing batteries that are up over 400 watt hours a kilogram. And I've got some thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. Let's hear those thoughts. But even before that, uh, what has been <laughs> what has been the uh, the historic annual increase in the energy density for lithium ion batteries, gravimetric energy density, and what should we expect going forward? How soon can we get to that three fifty four hundred watt hour per kilogram point? Well, the the increase has been modest. There's no Moore's law for batteries because Moore's law was always about silicon, 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 just getting better at putting more and more devices per unit area, but they never change chemistry. But for batteries, you've got to change chemistry, and that's that's a bigger order to, to fill. So there has been some improvement. You know, lithium ion burst on the scene at probably around 125 watt hours a kilogram, and, and now it might be getting up to closer to, to 150 and, and so on. And remember, we're talking about cell versus pack because people can quote fantastic numbers for a, for a 18650, which is you know, a little bit larger than a double A cell, but by the time you aggregate all those uh, cells into a battery pack and then put the battery management system and the power electronics and the casing and the uh, protection and so on, you're nowhere near those numbers of 150 plus watt hours per kilogram. So you know, I think most of the effort in the in the past 20 years has been directed at reducing the cost of the battery as opposed to improving. The performance. I mean, we're still basically lithium ion chemistry, not too different from what was rolled out in the early 1990s. But if you want to, to get to the better part of your question about, you know, wh where can we expect to go? If we get rid of the, the carbon host in the negative electrode, which some people mistakenly call the anode. So uh, if, if we go to lithium metal as the negative electrode, that's going to give you a big jump in energy density. And then uh, on the other side, where there's been just a gigantic paucity of uh, effort in radical innovation on the on the positive electrode, what some people mistakenly call the cathode, uh, you know, it's nickel oxide, manganese oxide, uh, cobalt oxide, and then you know people are desperately clinging to lithium iron phosphate. This is the same church, different pew. There, there, there is no radical innovation in that. And there's room for radical innovation on that side. And let's not forget about safety. You've got a volatile, flammable electrolyte. If I told you I have a brand new battery and it's got fantastic energy density and it runs on gasoline for the electrolyte, you'd ask me to leave the office. That's where you're going to see big pluses. You're going to have to have a radical jump in the, in the chemistry. And I'm going to go even further and say that lithium is fantastic. It's taken us a long way, but you know, uh, when you start looking at supply chain constraints and uh, the geographic distribution of resources on the planet, you want to have something I said in my TED talk, you want to make something dirt cheap, make it out of dirt, make it out of dirt that's locally sourced. That way you've got guaranteed supply chain. Then maybe we, we move off of uh, lithium. There's a few other metals left and get rid of the cobalt, nickel and manganese and the graphite. And then we'll have something that's cheap, safe. And it'll get you well over your 400 watt hours per kilogram. So before we move on to some of the other promising chemistries and we and we just focus on lithium ion and for purposes of calibrating our discussion, let's speak now the metrics at the cell level. What we know now in terms of state of the art, what exists in the market is around 250 watt hours per kilogram out of the 18650 cells which is good enough, but 350 and higher would certainly remove a lot of the operational constraints that drone operators are experiencing today. When do you see that we will have practically available lithium ion batteries at that level of performance, at 350 watt hour per kilogram on the cell level? At the cell level 350, I think that's attainable right now. You know, one of the companies that spun out of my lab, it's called uh, uh, Solid Energy Systems, which is now under the name SES. I, I know those people because some of them worked in my lab. And, and they've been able to produce uh, cells that are up over uh, 400 watt hours a kilogram. So I think it's possible to get there. 
It involves a lithium metal and a solid polymer electrolyte. So that means you're, you're trying to, there's two fronts that you're working on. One is the chemistry of the electrodes, and the second is to try to make the fraction of active material as high as possible. There's so many components in a, in a battery that are supportive. They're not actually active components. The only active components are the, are the, are the electrodes. The electrolyte is an, is an enabler, but you would like to have a vanishingly thin electrolyte and fat electrodes that the entirety of the electrode is active material. We, we've got all these other things. We've got separators, we've got membranes, we've got current collectors, and on and on and on. And that all adds mass and doesn't contribute anything to energy. Okay, 350 achievable today at commercial relevant cycles. What about three years from now and five years from now? What can we expect? Well, it depends on market forces. I mean, if everybody's focusing on getting material that is cost competitive for the automotive market, there's no incentive for the automotive market to go for 500 watt hours a kilogram. The big incentive there is get the, get the price point down because that's the big obstacle to widespread adoption of electric vehicles. In time, yeah, if all things were equal, you'd like to have a higher energy density. But if the choice before you is either go for lower cost with today's level of performance or go for higher performance, higher energy density at a higher cost, they're not going to choose that second option. Yeah, that, I mean, that's an interesting point because how motivated are automotive industry players to continue to invest in battery technology that gets you know ranges above what we're used to seeing in gasoline engines that's an, an interesting point that you bring up there has to be a large enough market opportunity in in some of these other markets including aviation to make sure that r d continues that's correct and i don't know to to, to what extent aviation can grab and hold the attention of people in the battery uh, industry Right now, they, they just see this gigantic market in uh, EVs, and they want to be players in, in that. So if we assume that the automotive industry continues to invest at the pace that it has been investing over the last decade or so, where do you think we might end up in the next three and the next five years? I don't think we're going to end up uh, very much farther at all, because the automotive industry invests in getting something that they can put into a car on the assembly line this afternoon. My experience has been that they do not make long-term investments. They, they, all they want to do is get, get a handle on the costs, on the supply chain, and so on. Radical innovation does not come from the auto industry, and radical innovation doesn't even come from the battery industry. The lithium-ion battery came to us from outside the battery industry. If you think back to the way the world was in 1989, it was 100% nickel metal hydride. And that was the dominant rechargeable battery at the time. It got us into our very first phones. They were candy bars or little flip phones. They weren't smartphones, but they were phones. And it got us our very first laptops. They were monochrome. They didn't have any wireless. They didn't have di 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 but, but you could take it on an airplane with you and work. Lithium ion came because Sony wanted to put it into their next generation of handheld cameras, the handy cams. And they went to all the battery producers in Japan who were making nickel metal hydride. And they had the formulation and said, here, make this battery. Here's a purchase order for some tens of millions of dollars. And every one of those battery producers refused to build that battery because they had capital investments in nickel metal hydride. So, you know, you think, you think first of all, do you think anybody's doing research in the battery industry on obsoleting lithium chemistry. And even if somebody showed up on the doorstep of one of these producers and said, here's the formulation for a new battery, they'd be greeted with the bouquets of flowers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So, so when we talk about some of these experimental and advanced and promising chemistries, where will this incentive come from? What market will provide the tailwind for the development of those? I think, I think you have people that uh, just pursue what they know to be radical innovation and get funding, whether it comes from, uh, from government funding or they manage to find uh, some private investment that is willing to take a chance on some kind of a new technology. But to get from the, the concept to first reduction of practice, what I've been advocating is, uh, is a skunk works where, where I, can, I can try out radical ideas without having to write proposals and write reports and get permission and so on and so forth. 
So it, it's going to come from some unexpected place. It's not going to come from, you know, one of the national labs or, or some big institution. When we think about commercializing a radically new battery technology, what can we draw from experience in the past in terms of lab to market time? Get ready for a long haul. It's not like writing code. It was about 10 years, right, for lithium uh, ion. Yeah, yeah. Now, maybe, maybe because we've worked so hard at uh, bringing the price of, uh, of lithium ion down, I was just looking at some old slides from when I started working on a liquid metal battery. And back in 2005, the capital cost of lithium ion was $2,000 a kilowatt hour. Well, we've come a long way down from that number. Now, maybe there are some lessons from the, uh, the upscaling and, and the down pricing of lithium ion that could be transferable to the next generation technology. Uh, because everybody would, would love to go for radical innovation and somehow compress the time to, 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 to upscale from the concept of the size of a postage stamp at the lab bench to something that, that you can start putting in product. So an entrepreneur who wants to build the next battery breakthrough, what advice would you have for them? And how do they convince regulators, especially in some of these highly regulated industries, that their battery is safe to be used in safety critical applications? I mean, you, you just you just have to demonstrate by uh, by building the thing at, at some scale that's representative of the final product and do, doing all the stress testing, uh, overcharging, over discharging, subjecting it to uh, abnormally high temperature, put a torch under it, the nail, the Dracula test, and so on, and demonstrate that the thing is safe under the most extreme conditions. There's no amount of, of data. You, you show them data from a paper that gets published in a top-tier journal, but they're not persuaded by such things. You've got to have the, the demonstration. Sure. So what should entrepreneurs expect in terms of time and capital? <laughs> yeah, expect pushback. You just have to be um, stubborn, uh, persevere. And capital, well, it depends on the nature of your, your chemistry, but you know, you're probably talking on the order of some millions of dollars for a Series A, somewhere between, I don't know, 8 and 10 million, so you can get a, a small group of people and start demonstrating the first level of, of upscaling and then maybe getting a, a second round. It's probably going to take you... $100 million over less than 10 years. We'd like to see that happen, maybe come down about seven years. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really rough slog, unless, unless you happen to come upon somebody who's independently wealthy and just says, let's just make this thing happen. All I care about is the upside, as opposed to give me your quarterly reports and things like that. Professor Sadaway, let's say a friend called you and said, I'm looking at something called the advanced air mobility space, so the VTOL, the drone and the like, and it's going to be a battery powered vehicle. Let's say the vertical takeoff aircraft. What would be your immediate reaction? I know you don't know the VTOL space as well as you know the batteries, but what's your gut reaction to a friend who's calling and saying, I'm thinking of investing in that space? Well, I'd have to know more about the, the physics of the, of the aircraft because I do know a little bit about drones. And, and I know that if you're not at about 400 watt hours a kilogram, you're going to have trouble getting off the ground. And even if you do get off the ground, you, you'd like to have a flight time that's, that's measured in, uh, in hours as opposed to seconds. So I'd, I'd have to understand that. But then, you know, if people start talking about they have to start getting up to, you know, seven, 800 watt hours a kilogram. I welcome that challenge, but it's going to have to be uh, unmitigated. If, if people say, I want to get up to 800 watt hours a kilogram at a capital cost of, of, of less than $100 a kilowatt hour, I'm saying, well, you've just defined something that uh, the answer is null set. So Obviously, one of your great advances is in the area of the liquid metal battery. Could you just tell us a little bit about it? The liquid metal battery was, was uh, devised in order to address the uh, unmet need of uh, stationary storage at massive scale. As name implies, stationary storage is not going to be moving around. So I just relaxed the whole thing about watt hours per kilogram. I don't care about the mass of the thing. All I care about is dollars per kilowatt hour per cycle. I want this thing to be accessible in terms of capital cost. And I want the thing to last for tens of years and not fade like a 
lithium ion battery fades. That was my uh, design space. And uh, the liquid metal battery, as the name implies, has uh, liquid metal electrodes and it has a molten salt electrolyte. It's a three layered system. Just think of salad oil and vinegar, only instead of two layers, we got three layers. So we got a low density liquid metal on top. Underneath that is a molten salt, which acts as the electrolyte. And beneath the molten salt is a high density liquid metal. That's what gives you the voltage, the, the difference in uh, chemical potential of the, the low density liquid metal and the high density liquid metal. And when the thing discharges, the liquid metal on the top alloys with the metal on the bottom. And when you charge the battery, you purify the alloy on the bottom and send the metal back up to the top. And because they're all liquids, they have no memory. So you don't have any of the failure mechanisms that are operative in the lithium ion battery. Mm -hmm. Nothing in there is flammable. It's made out of dirt cheap components. That's it. From your TED Talk of 2012, which is one of the most popular of all the TED Talks, if you were going to give that presentation again today mm. on the same topic, how would it change? Uh, I'd, I'd have a better image of, of what uh, scaling would look like. When I gave that talk back in 2012, we thought we were going to go to larger and larger. I talked about the shot glass and then the hockey puck, which is about three inches in diameter. And then we're going to go to the saucer, mm. six inches in diameter. And we're going to go to the pizza and so on. And then, then we're going to the bistro table. Well, it didn't happen that way. We very quickly came to the realization that the unit cell shouldn't be too big. It shouldn't be too small. But we were way over our, our skis on that one. So we've learned a lot in the interim. No, everything everything else is pretty much, uh, pretty much correct. Can we talk a little bit about the evolution of energy storage and energy storage in aviation? I've told you uh, that, that I'm, I'm not literate in you know, aerospace mm -hmm. engineering. So I, I know that you've got the auxiliary power units and so on and been uh, batteries on board the aircraft, especially these new ones like the 787 and the A350, which are 100% fly-by-wire. If that thing loses power, you've got no cables that are going to allow you to, to manipulate, to control the, the pitch and yaw and so on of the various airfoils. So you, you better make sure that you, if you lose the generation of power, at least you have something in reserve. We, we've seen some, some bad outcomes with putting a large format lithium ion on board. There's room for improvement on that side. As far as the primary propulsion, boy, I mean, that's, that's still in its infancy. But I welcome the challenge on that. And one of the key variables that extend the range or that impact the range for electric aircraft is the battery mass fraction. Do you have any views on when we might be able to see 3D printed batteries that act both as a as a load bearing aerostructure as well as an energy storage? That's, that's way off in the future. I, I'm, I think the effort to combine both structural members with electrochemical energy storage I, I, I can see that, you know, just as right now in, in the airplane, you can store fuel within the wing, but that doesn't mean that the fuel is part of the structural member. So I can imagine having batteries distributed so that you have distributed energy storage. And so indeed, the, the case of the battery could be the structural member, but trying to make the structural member double as, as one of the electrodes no, I was actually thinking of the of the former. Okay, well, it's fine. I mean, I can imagine. I, as far as three D, to me, that's a, that's a manufacturing technique. Once you've got the the chemistry nailed down, if you can resort to three D printing of of things, that's fine. As far as I'm concerned, but my main concern is the nailing down the electrochemistry. That is the composition of the the two electrodes and the electrolyte. So what are some of the promising approaches to these new chemistries that you're seeing in the horizon over the next five, seven years? What raises your eyebrow? Nothing. I see this out in the world. It's, it's really uh, incremental improvements over lithium ion. I see some people talking about sodium ion. I, I just don't see, I don't see a lot of radical innovation. And maybe that goes back to one of your earlier questions about how does an entrepreneur who wants to engage in radical innovation, how does, uh, how does that entrepreneur engage with uh, investors and so on? And now you're walking this tightrope between radical innovation and risk. I mean, investor wants what maximum impact and uh, minimal risk. And I can tell you that those two are orthogonal coordinates. Radical innovation comes with risk. Low risk comes with incremental improvements. If 
you want radical innovation, there's going to be risk. And right now, what I'm seeing in, in the literature and so on is happy endings to the stories. Very little taking of chances. You've got, you've got to really break the paradigm of today. And what about, what are your thoughts on lithium sulfur or lithium metal? Well, I think lithium metal is a step in the right direction, giving you much more to your earlier point about increasing the active fraction. Because right now you've got the, in the negative electrode, it's got this graphite host, which is just sitting there. It's, it's, it's basically a parking garage for, for lithium. And if you, if you get rid of that garage and, and just have the lithium as lithium metal, you got a gigantic increase in uh, energy. I mean, uh, pure lithium is over 3,800 milliamp hours per gram, whereas with the graphite, you, you fill that up with uh, lithium, you're, you're down below 400 milliamp hours per gram. So that's, that's a step in the right direction. And then if you, if, if you get into something that's got something that's more energy dense and higher lithium capacity than the, the, the shop worn transition metal oxides, the cobalt oxide, nickel oxide, manganese oxide, then you could start seeing major jump in, in energy density. So because some of the stuff that I see is people people trying to substitute the graphite based uh, negative electrode in the lithium ion battery to substitute that by lithium metal but they they don't think about what's happening on the other side you can't fully lithiate cobalt oxide or nickel oxide there's a limited range of lithiation if you try to put too much lithium in there you will trigger a phase change and then the structure collapses and now it's been damaged irreversibly there's a limited range. How do you expand that range? So again, th- there's room for radical innovation. Putting lithium metal is smart. You should really be thinking about what's going on at the other side. And then as far as lithium sulfur goes, it's advantageous because it's much lower cost. So sulfur is a lot cheaper than cobalt oxide, and it's, it's more readily available. But uh, no one's been able to make that thing work properly because the, the sulfur is sparingly soluble in the electrolyte. And then you end up with these uh, multiple valences of sulfur that uh, lead to uh, parasitic side reactions. They call it redox looping. And so while you've got a beautiful open circuit voltage and you make your calculation, you say, wow, this is going to give us a, a big boost in, in energy density. It turns out that when you try to run it, it's, it's as though somebody punctured a hole in, in the tire. No one's been able to make that thing really work. I mean, that's not to say it can't work. We've been at it for a long time. Are you excited about the use of carbon nanotubes to increase the energy density? No. Care to elaborate? <laughs> well, I answered your question correctly. That's a yes or no. The answer is no. The, the reason is, I mean, nano, nano has fantastic uh, properties, but, you know, when it comes to cost, there, there, there are some factors there. And then also these nanotubes typically are involved in some kind of a structural setup where the nanotubes are almost like fingers sticking out from a, from a substrate and so on. I start looking at the complexity of all that and wonder if that's uh, really scalable. I think that there are, there are more imaginative solutions than that. So if I, correct me if I'm wrong, but if I summarize our discussion so far, you you see a future with continuous incremental improvements up to a certain point where the autom- automotive industry does not have the incentive anymore to invest in any any better energy density levels, correct? That's pretty well. Pretty well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What about, you mentioned hydrogen and not really being a fan. What would you, uh, well, first of all, can you tell us why your position is that way? And what would you tell to the entrepreneurs and uh, companies that are investing lots of capital in hydrogen? Uh, Well, from my perspective, uh, hydrogen is a, it's a low uh, energy density uh, carrier. It's not an energy source, it's a carrier. I know people have been proponents of hydrogen for, for example, in things like long long haul trucking and things like that. The attractive thing about hydrogen is that because it's a gas, you can very quickly refuel. So it has that going for it. The The actual operation of the proton exchange membrane fuel cell is not so straightforward. Any of these uh, trucks that have PEM fuel cells on them also have batteries on them because the fuel cell alone can't do everything that has to be done. You start looking at the responses at, at temperature extreme, especially when the temperature gets down below the freezing point of water, which does happen over wide swaths of uh, North America. And then, of course, there's the whole question of crashworthiness. 
where you've got these hydrogen tanks that are pressurized to you know tens of thousands of psi so there's there's a lot of a lot of question marks there but aren't they already certified for road use with uh, hydrogen powered cars they are they are all electric vehicles are certified too and you know occasionally you will have a fire it's it's true when i look at the whole picture i would i would much rather just take that energy and uh, store it in a battery directly so you have electrons in and electrons out instead of electrons mediated by hydrogen which then comes back out and so on just more and more steps you know it's a big market there's plenty of room for for different solutions it's just my own preference i'm not going to disparage people who want to invest in hydrogen as i said before a man's got to know his limitations and i have no interest in fuel cells and i have no interest in hydrogen when it comes to measuring a battery's level of charge is that something that can be done certifiably and accurately today or how much leakage or margin of error exists yeah there's there's a lot of margin of error so you know the, the simple thing is that people would measure the open circuit voltage and they would say that when the battery is say let's say we're, we're talking about lithium ion so as it's getting close to a full discharge or as far as you want to go in discharging because as i said earlier there's a range in in both the the negative electrode and the positive electrode, how far you want to go with lithiation and delithiation. Otherwise, you risk causing some kind of structural change in the in the crystallography of the material. But let's say you're getting towards the asymptotic endpoint. You know that the voltage of the cell is going to drop down closer and closer to, say, 3 volts or something like that. And then when it goes to charge up, you're, you're getting up to you know, 3.8 or, or something like that. And so as a sort of a like a dipstick kind of measurement, the open circuit voltage of that cell could give you some indication. Is it, is it near full or is it near fully depleted and so on? If, if you want to get a more accurate estimate of, of what the remaining range is, you really should be integrating the, the charge that you've passed from the time that you first began to discharge the full cell. And that means you integrate current over time, you, you basically count coulombs and you say, I know I've got a certain number of coulombs of charge here, and whether I bleed them by fast acceleration and, and high-speed driving, or whether I go stop and go in traffic, all I know is that I've passed a certain number of coulombs, and I know I've got a certain number left on the, on the battery. Tell us a little bit about Ambry. How did it come about? What problems does it solve for its customers? So Ambry was a company that we spun out of my lab here at MIT. Actually, it was my students that came to me and said, we want to start a company. I wasn't really keen on it because I'm a professor. I, I thought companies are sort of corrupting and so on. But they said, listen, you keep talking about science and service to society. You can't just publish papers. You've got to get that technology into customer hands. And I said, okay, I'm persuaded. So we started the company. And uh, it was a journey like we, nothing we could have imagined because we had a battery chemistry that worked beautifully here at, at MIT in the lab. But now what we had to do was to upscale it and figure out how to build it at scale, which meant we had to invent the entire universe of manufacturing. In spite of all the work that had been done on driving down the cost of lithium-ion batteries, almost everything that we do in the manufacture of lithium-ion batteries was not transferable to the liquid metal battery. The chemistry is so different, the operating temperature is so, so different. So we had to invent all of that, and it's, and it's been a long journey, including uh, everybody knows that there are some high temperature seals on the, on the liquid metal battery cell that allow feed through for the, the connectors on the, uh, on the negative electrode. And that's got to be a ceramic because we're operating around 500 degrees centigrade. And finding a ceramic that can stand up to the kind of low density metal that's in the top of that cell and do so at a something far below a NASA price point, that was a challenge that we were not anticipating. But we've managed to, to solve that, that mm. technical problem. Here we are. I, f I figure by this time next year, we'll be shipping first product to, to customers. The, the, the whole business of, of translating something that works in, a, in something the size of a shot glass in a laboratory to something big enough to, to store 100 megawatt hours of electricity on a footprint the size of several shipping containers, that's a journey that's uh, far removed from 
electrochemistry. You obviously caught the attention of Bill Gates with Ambry, and I believe he's one of the investors. How has it met his expectations? Well, he's been uh, steadfast with us. He came to see me because he was watching my chemistry lectures online. We spent about 90 minutes in my office back in 2009, and he wanted to talk to me about distance learning and computers and education. He just stepped down as the chairman of Microsoft. And then at, towards the end of the conversation, he said, well, so what else are you working on? And, and this was early days. I didn't have any results yet, but I sketched the idea, the concept of the liquid metal battery on a whiteboard in my office. And he looked at it and he said, uh, seems to me that the, the fundamental uh, assumptions behind the, the design of a battery for stationary storage uh, ought to be different from mobile storage. And I said, you're smart. Most of my colleagues think that lithium ion is the answer to everything. He said, if you ever decide to spin this out, let me know. (laughs) And so my students uh, approached him a a year later, and he became our our first investor. Not because I wrote a dynamite article for the Wall Street Journal, but because I was dutifully teaching first-year chemistry. And somehow he started watching one of my lectures, then watched every (laughs) one of me, watched 35 (laughs) lectures every year. I mean, the guy just became really hooked on uh, uh, general chemistry. And that's how I met him. And he became our first investor. That's great. So how will, That's a great story. How will your customers or how will the world be different if Fambury is a great success? Well, I think it uh, will enable people to green their, uh, their electricity supply. So first customers are likely to be uh, data farms. People do cloud computing, mm-hmm. uh, massive number crunching. You can guess who these enterprises mm-hmm. will be. And they want to go 100% green, so that if they, they put up massive uh, solar arrays, they're going to need storage. And they know that it, it's foolish to install lithium-ion storage capacity at, uh, at such uh, numbers. You build a 100-megawatt-hour lithium-ion battery, this is, you're going to be spending so much of your energy just engaging in thermal management so the thing doesn't catch fire. I think once people see the Ambry battery deployed, then um, it will then lead to multiplication. I mean, this is a very, very conservative, capital-intensive sector of the economy where nobody wants to be first when it comes to radical innovation. But everybody wants to be first to be second. So once it's demonstrated to operate at scale, then the risk will have been reduced to the point where others are willing to join in. Professor, on the broad topic of electric propulsion, do you see any opportunities or any concerns that the the general public isn't really paying much attention to? Yeah, I I don't think that people understand the whole business about uh, uh, storage. I mean, if you want to talk about electric propulsion of vehicles, for example, so you got on board, uh, say, 50 to 100 kilowatt hour packs, where are you going to charge them? I mean, I I live in a high-rise building here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and there are no charging points. There's one. If I wanted to bring an electrician to wire in a charging point so that I could charge an electric vehicle, we don't have the amperage on the street to even draw upon. So if you take a look at uh, systematically the whole shift to all electrics, we have to be considering the uh, uh, fueling of them. And that doesn't mean just putting in more copper. It means maybe we should be putting in storage at the charging point so that your car pulls up. Let's say you want to charge up half of a 100 kilowatt hour packs you want to put on 50 kilowatt hours. Instead of drawing high amperage out of a line, you've got a battery that's about the size of a large refrigerator sitting there. And it's got several hundred kilowatt hours in it. And you do B to B, battery to battery. You trickle charge up to restore that that battery as opposed to putting in massive new copper lines that are going to give the amperage that otherwise you'd need. If you're on an expressway and you pull over to one of these service centers and you see, say, a half a dozen or so cars side by side, each of them with a motorist pumping fuel, you think each of those pumps, each of those hoses is connected to a refinery? No, it goes to a giant cistern beneath the, the parking area. And there's thousands and thousands of gallons of fuel there. Well, we should be thinking the same way with the recharging uh, electrically. We don't have each charging point with a dedicated line connected to a a generating facility. So, again, storage is is key everywhere. If you don't have storage, the, the whole movement, the energy transition 
could uh, find itself falling into a major speed bump. If we were going to see a radical innovation in the battery industry, what would it be, regardless of risk? What would be the radical innovation and who's most likely to bring it about? Well, radical innovation would be a, a, a shift away from uh, lithium chemistry to yet some other chemistry. Now, I've got some thoughts on that, but I'm, I'm not about to share them. Just keep watching me. And uh, yeah, it, it just goes back to what I said before. It's that the radical innovation would be a uh, superior chemistry insofar as it's uh, better than lithium ion performance at a much lower cost and and among the performance metrics is the whole question of safety so that under no circumstances can the thing catch fire and then of course the whole business what we've learned through the pandemic is that these uh, global supply chains are, are mm-hmm. fragile we should be mindful of uh, how we're sourcing the components so that we don't end up in a situation where there are some key components that are missing because you can't build the system with 99% of the parts. That 1% is enough to bring the whole thing to a halt. So I think there's room for improvement because when, when lithium ion was, was really upscaled, nobody was thinking about such things. But now now we know differently. So uh, let's, uh, let's leverage all the things that we've learned from the past, uh, certainly the past three years maybe even going back the past 10 years. If you take a look at, uh, there was this uh, article by Bloomberg New Energy Finance that came out around 2016 or something like that. They had this graph where they showed starting in 2010 that lithium ion was $1,000 a kilowatt hour and it's coming down, 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 down. And then they they fit this thing to a linear regression on a semi-log plot and they're projecting out to 2030 and it's going to be down below $73 a kilowatt hour. Looking at that, saying, do you really think the future is a mirror of the past? And, of course, once we get to 2022, the price of everything is going up. The price of lithium carbonate, the price of nickel, the price of cobalt, on and on and on. So all those assumptions go out the window. And um, maybe somebody would be saying, maybe we should have been investing some mad money into wild ideas, radical innovation, and so on. There are several now publicly traded companies for vertical takeoff and landing aircraft have said that the battery will be their source of power. Let's say we had the largest investor in those companies on the call right now, and he or she said to you, what advice would you give me in evaluating those companies where they're completely dependent on the battery to power their aircraft? What would be one or two pieces of advice you'd give to them? Well, you better learn some electrochemistry so that you can make an independent decision. You know, Thomas Edison said that when when a man starts working on a secondary battery, that's a rechargeable battery, that brings out his latent capacity to lie. So uh, you, you've got to be careful where you're getting your information from when it comes to battery people. Uh, you need to have a, a, a sober, independent assessment of, of what the true performance is of that. You know, it, it there may not be something that is off-the-shelf ready. You may have to invent the future. Where would you recommend that they turn to for advice, independent advice? Me. Professor, if you fast forward five years and then 10 years out, what does the, what does the future look like in terms of batteries, in terms of electric propulsion? Well, I think the future will continue to be uh, more and more electrified. And, and so there's going to be room for improvement. People are, we have a huge cadre of people working on uh, uh, batteries now. When I first started working on batteries in the early 90s here at MIT, people looked at me askance saying, what are you working on batteries for? They thought it was kind of like hmm. old, old fuddy-duddy stuff. and They just didn't see that there's all of this possibility. No one is worried about CO2 emissions. All this stuff is just very recent. But I remember those days. And so uh, now you have people, not just electrochemistry, chemistry, physics, it's, it's all over. Material science, everything is dominated by search for superior batteries, superior performance, and so on. So I'm confident that out of all of these people working on this, there will be some improvements, and uh, and that will get us moving in the, in the right direction. But then in the midst of all of this uh, will come something that is truly a breakthrough, and that, that will then catapult us into a, a new level of... Uh, of performance 
probably by a, a mechanism that is different from everything that we know today. I mean, this this was the the genius of John Goodenough when he discovered the lithium cobalt oxide electrode was it, it works in a way that's so different from the way, say, the positive electrode in a lead acid battery works or even in the sodium sulfur battery. All of those were well known and understood and so on. What Goodenough saw in in the mechanism by which cobalt oxide works, it uh, opened our eyes to a whole new universe of, of possibilities on the positive electrode side. I'm confident that uh, we haven't quite uh, tapped out everything that Mother Nature has to uh, uh, reveal if we figure out where, which, which door to knock on. So th- there will be some improvements and, and, and then there'll be some radical innovations. Given your background with energy, with batteries, where are opportunities for, for new businesses that could make a difference? And what advice would you give to the entrepreneurs? Well, look, now you're asking me business questions. So <laughs> don't, don't ask me about business. Don't ask me about health sciences either. But, <laughs> but I mean, you know, if, if they're looking for what's the next, the next big thing, if they recognize it as some variant of, of, of lithium ion, then it's not. It's going to be something that's going to be quite shocking. Arthur C. Clarke said that a, a true innovation is indistinguishable from, from magic. I mean, if I told you uh, 40 years ago that you would hold in, in the palm of your hand a device that could stream video and, and would access every piece of information archived on the planet, you'd say that's, that's impossible. And that's what you hold in your hand today. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for something that contain so much energy and charge and discharge without hazard and so on. And you say, well, why didn't we think of this before? Your years at MIT teaching, and you were perhaps the most popular teacher while you were there. What is the greatest thing you learned? And what do you think is the greatest one thing your your students learned? Well, I think that uh, several things. One is... uh, so I was teaching this uh, large uh, chemistry class, and it was uh, introductory. It was a general chemistry, mm-hmm. dominantly taken by first-year students. The big thing that I learned was uh, there was a clarity that came to me by having to, to break down this uh, discipline into the learning steps of a first-time learner. In doing so, mm-hmm. it clarified my understanding of chemistry in ways that were, there was a clarity there that that wasn't before. And, and I can honestly say that everything that I've done in, in uh, electrochemistry, both in the area of batteries and in the area of um, uh, electrochemical processing of metals, like the, the molten oxide electrolysis for green steel and so on, all of that came from dutifully teaching this uh, early service class of uh, general chemistry and understanding how to present in a logical manner with clarity, these uh, fundamental ideas. And that, that may be a better inventor. Uh, you know, they say that if you really want to learn something, then teach it. And it's easy to say, and people smile mm. and so on. But I can, I can give uh, attestation of that, that the, the, the reason I became adept at invention was not because I went and took advanced classes, because I went the other direction and really figured out how to teach to a first-time learner. The kids are 18, 19 years old. They're very bright, but, you know, they're kids. And I imagine I'm sitting in a class as an 18-year-old looking at me teach. I, I, I had video recordings of, of these lectures going back to the 90s. And I remember when I was a child, sometimes my father would yell at the television. And uh, I thought, he's, he's really losing it. <laughs> and then here I am uh, years later, and I'm yelling at the television, <laughs> yelling at myself, saying, you can't go from that step to this step. You left something out. you got to change it. I go and change the lecture and so on. And by refining and refining and refining, there was a clarity that came from that. That's what I, what I learned by, by teaching. And, of course, the, I would go into the, the sections because you teach a class of 500-plus students. There's no room for questions. You could, should that be a minus sign or something? Okay, fine. But they can't, they can't have Q&A. But they have Q&A sessions, and I'd go to some of those. And some of the questions I'd get – would knock me off my balance. And I'd say, wait a minute, that's a great question. I, I've never thought about that. So you can learn things from your students and, and you can teach things to your students. As far as wh- what, I, what I really did teach them, I think I taught them just by 
by the way I, I rolled out the subject matter and the way I told the story, many of them came to me and said that they learned something far beyond chemistry. I, at, at some point along the journey, I, I realized that I can say anything I want in that room as long as it's not vulgar or, or demeaning. And so I would bring in music, art, literature, <laughs> and talk about ethics, everything, but within the context of the class. It wasn't, okay, we've done with the chemistry. Now we're going to go to another room with another professor. We're going to study literature. We're going to study ethics. No, we put everything in. So I said, it's no longer a chemistry class. It's mm -hmm. a chemistry-centered class. It can be anything. And students students warmed up to that because, you know, like 90 plus percent of the students who are taking this chemistry class as a requirement aren't going to major in chemical sciences. The majority of students at MIT right now are majoring in computer science. They have no interest in this whatsoever. And I said, okay, I'm going to, this is my challenge. By the end of this semester, I want you to look back on this and say, that chemistry class was my favorite class and I hate chemistry. But damn it, that guy made me love chemistry. And not by, you know, stand-up comedy or just some kind of frivolous, uh, give everybody an A and everybody's happy. No, it's by, by engaging with people and meeting them, them halfway and then pull them along. For me, that's, it's very gratifying. And then, of course, you know, with, with the, the growth of the internet, the web, and uh, by the time, say, by the early 2000s, about 2003, 2004, once we got to the point where we could have streaming video, then... They could record my lectures and people could tune into them at any time, at any place. It was, uh, the reach was far beyond the walls of the classroom. For me, that was, uh, that was gratifying. As you, you summarize your podcast, recognizing that our audience are aviation technologists, technologists in general, and advanced air mobility enthusiasts and professionals. What would be one message you would want to send out? Keep an open mind. Let's say you, you're talking about aviation. You say, you guys are aviator, you gals, you're aviation centered, but you're not aviation only. There's no barriers. And just, just keep your eyes open, keep your ears tuned up, and just observe. And you will find answers, you'll find inspiration in the most unlikely places. Luca, any other questions from you? What a great way to end. Professor, thank you so much for your time. It's been a, a true uh, treat and an honor to have you on the show. Well, I'm, I'm honored that you uh, contacted me. You wanted to talk to me. So, uh, all right. So everybody's honored. Everybody's happy. And uh, <laughs> I hope that the listeners uh, get a, get a, are honored as well. Yeah, right. Maybe I could refer to the, to the electrochemistry, and I hope they get a charge out of this as well. <laughs> There you go. Thank you, Perfect. Professor Sadway. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Good Thank luck. You. We'll see you. Thank you. Right, bye bye. All right, that's a wrap for today. Thank you for listening to the Vertical Space Podcast. Reach out if there are topics that you would like us to discuss, and goodbye until the next episode. Unless mentioned, this podcast is in no way endorsing or promoting any person and or company mentioned, and all opinions within the podcast are solely that of the presenters. The vertical space makes no guarantees, warranty, or representation of any information given in this podcast. Any information given is for informational purposes and should be used at your own risk. This podcast is for general, educational, and entertainment purposes only.